thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's session. Uh, today we have Christian uh, from University of California, Fullerton, and he'll be talking about his uh, new tool, which is going to be about three-dimensional models for nonlinear analysis of reinforced concrete walls. He developed this tools by, I mean, from scratch, I guess. Uh, so he'll be talking about them and we'll be learning and these are going to be out soon, right? Like, for example, my understanding? One of them is already out. The other oh. ones will be out soon. Yeah. Cool. OK, so it's all yours now. Like, thank sure. you for presenting. Sure. OK, let me share my screen. And I think you need to allow me to. Oh, I did. Share screen. OK. Can you try? All right. And, okay, let me just move things a little bit around here. All right. <clears throat> okay, so thank you, Pavan, for the invitation. It's been really a pleasure to be here. I've been following your uh, your support group, and as I was just talking to Pavan, I'm really glad to be part invited to to present here. So I'm going to talk about some. Uh, new three-dimensional models for reinforced concrete walls that are developed based on some existing models that were 2D and then we ex ex basically extended these models to three dimensions. And there's actually three different models that are coming to OpenSeas really soon. One of them is already there actually starting uh, this weekend. So very, very new stuff. So before I begin, I wanna uh, just acknowledge and thank to all my academic colleagues, John Wallace from UCLA, Guy Rachel from Bogajici in Turkey, Leonard Masone from the University of Chile, who uh, helped in development and advised in many different ways developing these models, as well as the students at Casa Fortin who worked in development and validation of these models. Uh, you can see their faces over here. They had a great time, and uh, I did as well. And those are Nathan, Kamiar, uh, Ross, Carlos, and Ben. So this is a completed project. We're wrapping it up, publishing our papers, and uh, publishing the models as well. Um, so here's a little uh, outline of the presentation. Basically, a little bit of the background, just to put us all on the same page in terms of rainforest concrete walls. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these currently uh, available models, uh, which are two-dimensional models. They were implemented a few years ago. Um, if you're, you know, looking into modeling of walls, you're probably aware of these models. But just quickly glance through them, and then we're going to spend most of the time here talking about the 3D models for RC walls that are the new ones. Talking about describing those models, validation, when are they gonna be uh, released? And then I'm gonna show you two examples of their application to dynamic analysis uh, of buildings. Um, so just a little bit of the background, you know, reinforced concrete walls, they're very commonly used worldwide to resist the seismic forces uh, that because they provide a large strength and stiffness to the structural system. You can find them as isolated walls, such as this wall over here, or you can find them as a couple or a core walls, such as this picture over here. And given the performance-based design, which is more and more used in design and evaluation of buildings, uh, using the nonlinear models is very common, and having good models uh, for perform these tasks is really, really important. So just, you know, in general, we can kind of classify reinforced concrete walls uh, and their behavior and failure modes according to their aspect ratio. So, you know, roughly if you have a reinforced concrete wall with height divided by length, which we call aspect ratio, bigger than three, those walls are primarily flexure dominated. If we have something that we call medium rise walls and between one and a half and three aspect ratio, those are dominated kind of with a combination of flexural and shear uh, deformations. And if we have squat walls, such as this one over here, they are shear dominated. And you can see by the cracking patterns of these walls, how here's basically pure shear. Here we can see both horizontal and diagonal cracks. Here we really can't see the cracks, but obviously with such a slender wall like this one, it's a flexure dominated. So that's kind of a big picture. First thing, when you look at the wall, you kind of that's the first thing you notice, and that can tell you something, how, what you can expect in terms of behavior of the world. So let's talk about these existing models just real quick. And uh, 
These models are implemented in 2005, I believe, in open seas. They were, some of these models were part of my PhD dissertation at UCLA. And then after that, we implemented them in open seas. And there's a peer report from 2015 that describes these models. And uh, here, in, as a part of that effort back uh, in 2015, we implemented the MVLEM model, the shear flexure interaction MVLEM. And then we implemented this uh, two-dimensional material, which is called fixed strut angle model for reinforced concrete. And we also implemented two uniaxial material models, concrete CM and steel MPF. So uh, you can read about all these models in uh, corresponding um, papers, but the implementation part of it is published in this paper here in Computers and Structures. There is a reference and as well uh, in this peer report. So, you know, the MVLEM model is basically a two-dimensional two-node element. It's kind of like a beam column element, but it's two-dimensional and it's, uh, it's primarily uh, for walls because it has this kind of a planar cross-section which you discretize into fiber. So essentially it's a fiber model. It has these rigid beams at top and bottom. And it has a total of six degrees of freedom at these two nodes. The behavior of, of these uniaxial uh, fiber elements is really governed by the, by the concrete and steel material models that are uniaxial materials as well. And they're used to behave the flexure, to describe the flexural behavior of this element. And then the shear behavior is uncoupled from the flexural behavior and it's defined and behaves according to the shear spring, whatever material you use. Here is the wiki page. Uh, back in the day now, the OpenSea is moving to GitHub, but in that time uh, there's wiki pages for these models. So you can read more about them and how to use these models here. There's some examples as well. So this model was validated for, because it's a mostly flexure dominated uh, kind of a flexural model because it has these flexural fibers and the shear spring. So we validated it pretty much uh, mostly against uh, the flexural dominated walls, such as this one, <clears throat> specimen RW2, for example, from Townsend and Wallace. And you can see that it has a pretty good, uh, behaves pretty well in terms of the global force deformation and also in terms of the uh, strains predicted uh, at the base of the wall. So both global and local behavior were pretty reasonably well predicted. However, when you try to model, uh, say, a, a medium rise wall that has a significant contribution of shear deformations, then this model is may not be the most appropriate one. So here we have three results uh, that, that are different in the way the shear behavior and that shear spring was modeled. If you use linear elastic shear, you will get something like this, right? Where you basically overestimating the capacity. Then you can say, okay, you know, now, you know, because this particular specimen had significant contribution of shear deformations, maybe I wanna use a, kind of like an elastoplastic shear spring. And then depending on what capacity you put into that spring, you can get these results. And these results on a big kind of global uh, behavior seem quite reasonable, although you can see kind of like uh, artificial uh, behaviors, not really a natural. And the reason is that, again, here, if you look at the shear behavior of these specimens, so this is just the shear deformations versus the lateral load. In the linear elastic case, you're doing, with the model, you're doing something like this, but your actual specimen is experiencing something that looks like this blue line. If you try to do that with uh, other types of the shear hinges, again, you can, you can kind of match reasonably well these shear displacements, but the big problem here is that these shear and flexural behavior are totally uncoupled from one another. So the, the actual flexural strains now and the, the local responses will not be predicted very well. So this was kind of a motivation to develop a model that really captures the interaction between shear and flexure in a physical manner and, and, and can predict these type of results without any artificial parameters adding you know, these different shear behaviors and so forth. So for that reason, we developed this shear flexure interaction version of this model, still a two-dimensional model, but we replaced each uniaxial fiber with the two-dimensional material model for reinforced concrete. And uh, this material model is essentially a 2D plane stress uh, relationship between strain and stress, right? It's like a material model in two dimensions. And after we have that, we basically obtain this, what we call the shear flexure interaction and VLEM. That one is also published. Uh, there's a wiki page link down here and it's been 
used uh, in the past few years by few, several people I've been contacted many times. So uh, it's been popular, right? And, and really it's, uh, here's the benefit of this model, right? Here we can see that for this same wall that the MVLEM was kind of very sensitive to the different predictions of the different way you model the shear behavior. This particular model uh, captures the interaction between, between shear and flexure and, you know, in, in a physical manner. So you can see here in the shear behavior, we can actually ca uh, obtain the nonlinear shear response, the nonlinear shear hysteresis that is pinched, which is pretty typical for uh, shear behavior. And also the yielding between shear and flexure occurs about the same level of la lateral load, and which is also what was observed in the test which tells us that the model does capture the interaction between shear and flexure. So shear flexural interaction. Excuse me. So, you, sorry, uh, hello? one quick yeah. question. Uh, sure. The blue lines are the uh, experimental and the red lines are the model. Oh yeah, there is, sorry. Yeah, the test Mine. is the red, the model is the blue. Um, just, uh, you know, this two-dimensional model for reinforced concrete that was put into the SFI and VLEM uh, is what we call the fixed strut angle model, FSAM, also available in open seas, right? Here's the link to the wiki page, and here's the actual um, reference to the paper. And it's a fairly complex two-dimensional material model for concrete, uh, reinforced concrete. It really has a these two fixed struts that uh, have the ability to behave first as uncracked concrete, then the first crack forms and the second crack forms. So it has like a three stages of behavior. And uh, steel is modeled through the basically uniaxial, horizontal and vertical uh, reinforcement behavior. And on top of that, we have these two shear aggregate interlock, uh, uh, two shear resisting mechanisms uh, uh, across the cracks of concrete, which will be the shear aggregate interlock model, as well as the dowel action, which is in this case model just like a linear elastic. So this is the element or actually the model that was implemented in open seas. In the past couple of years, Dr. Orakchal from Bogajic University worked and improved this model quite a bit in terms of uh, modeling of shear aggregate interlock and the dowel action and uh, uh, extended this model. So we're hoping that in the near future we can implement that one an improved version of this fixed strut angle model in open seas as well. Here's some validation against the panel tests. You can see that the stresses and strains are predicted pretty well with, these, uh, with this material model. And uh, moving on to the uniaxial concrete material, this is a Schengen Mander formulation, but Open Seas really at the time didn't have a full form formulation implemented. And what's really uh, kind of specific for this material model is that it's very detailed. And as you can see on this, uh, conceptual strain stress behavior, uh, it has these transition curves that are smooth, and it also has the ability to, uh, to model this gradual gap closure uh, uh, when, the, when basically concrete uh, gaps are closing, right? So a, a lot of models don't have that, and they have very abrupt closure, and that can actually affect your results. And we will see later on, I have one example to show you how choice of different material models will actually affect your results. So here as well, additional, uh, feature of this model is that if you zoom into the tension side, it has this parabolic tension stiffening versus like uh, linear tension stiffening, for example, concrete O2, right? So it's fairly complex model for, for uniaxial material model for concrete. And then we implemented it in open seas as well. Uh, there was a simplified version of that model, which was concrete O7, uh, which is also Chang'e Mander formulation, but simplified. And you can see how the hysteretic uh, rules are kind of improved in this concrete CM formulation. Of course, with that complexity comes uh, numerical efficiency and stability. So it's kind of a trade-off. Sometimes, you know, if you need something that, where this makes a big difference and it's available to you, but if you want to model a 40 story tall building, maybe you can get away with the simpler material model. So it's really the matter of choice. Um, and finally, uh, part of this whole back background implementation was steel MPF, which is Minigoto Pinto, uh, Filippo model, and they're basically, it's the same as steel O2 in a way, but improved. Uh, again, the steel O2, um, and it has some kind of an anomaly in the sense that if you have a little unloading in your strain history, like a partial unloading, let's say in one time step due to say crushing concrete in some other part, 
of the structure this particular fiber wants to unload or because of the time history such that causes this unloading. And actually steel O2 will overshoot this train, you know, if you keep going forward and it will behave kind of unrealistically, like you see with this red lines. So the steel MPF, uh, we fix those uh, problems by adding a lot of history variables to track what's going on with the strain history and to overcome uh, that issue. So that produces a little bit, uh, I don't know, it produces more realistic behavior. And this is part of the formulation of the model, which is actually a, this anomaly is, is acknowledged by Filippo in their papers. And uh, so it's not part of the how steel 2 is implemented. It's actually part of the model formulation. Uh, and there's another detail. It's about uh, curvature, uh, you know, this transition curvature from elastic to plastic, uh, how it degrades with cycles in the pre pre-yielding range. So those are the major differences between the steel MPF and steel O2. Um, here are some examples. For example, uh, this is the RW2 specimen test versus, uh, versus model. Using the concrete CM and steel MPF, you can see the results are quite, um, quite, quite reasonable, quite good. But then if we, for example, use different material models, such as uh, concrete O7, uh, you get this kind of a different looking line, right? Obviously due to simplification of concrete material model, uh, the hysteretic shape is not as natural, natural looking. And then if we use, for example, concrete O2, concrete O2 doesn't have that uh, gradual clo gap closure that concrete CM does. And because of that, you see in this region here, when you're re reaching back to zero displacement, your gaps are closing very gradually and then picks up. So you basically have that um, very, very pinched behavior. So this is just a quick example of how using different material models actually affects hysteretic predicted hysteretic behavior. So to sum up this part, uh, kind of introductory part, uh, what's currently available are these classes over here, uh, MVLEM, SFI, MVLEM. If you want to do just a two-dimensional analysis, this is the way to go. There's no reason to get anything more complicated than that. Uh, sort of a flexural model, the SFI, the shear flexion interaction model, and these material models here. But if you want to go and model, uh, these models are only 2D, and that's their downside. And if you want to uh, model a complex building system where you have, you know, uh, interactions between walls and beams, and the walls might not be just two-dimensional, but also it's like a core wall or, or a T-shaped wall or something like that, then you have a problem because first of all, because of the two dimensional formulation, it's simply impossible to model a whole building. And secondly, the connection between these, uh, say wall element and a beam element, uh, currently, current three dimensional models, for example, beam column element, doesn't really allow that, right? They are only two node elements. So a lot of times what we have to do, if we wanna do this with current tools in open seas, you can, for example, choose to do either displacement-based or force-based element, but you would have to have some kind of embedded beams to, to connect the center line of your wall element to the, the beam, right? And that's kind of cumbersome. It's not really a problem or anything like that. It, it's just cumbersome. And then your model stability and results also depend on the, on the parameters of this embedded beams. So the next part of the presentation is going to show uh, basically work that was motivated by these two shortcomings, the lack of the three-dimensional models for walls and the fact that you have to you use this embedded beam, uh, which makes it just cumbersome. So in the next models I will show, we uh, overcame the, these issues. So I'm going to switch gears here to these new 3D models, okay? The three-dimensional models that I'm going to be discussing today, uh, there's going to be three of them. Uh, two of these models are directly derived from the original two-dimensional formulations from the multiple vertical element and SFI MVLEM. So we have something that we're now going to call MVLEM 3D and SFI MVLEM 3D. And then uh, we also added uh, one additional class, which is I, I call it Quad RC because it's a it's a finite element four-node uh, type of a model that is really not only for walls, but for any type of reinforced concrete element, you can model diaphragms with that or, or anything else that requires uh, kind of area elements, right? So these are the three new classes that are coming into OpenSeas this year. In fact, the MVLEM 3D is already there 
and these other two are coming but we're just waiting for papers to be published mvlm 3d paper is in print right now so let's talk about uh, uh, that a little bit how do we extend the 2d to 3d <clears throat> well it conceptually it was fairly simple we just basically said okay we had two nodes let's first step let's convert this two node element into a four node element and in order to do that we added some internal beams uh, to basically interpolate the formations and strains in this type of an element and so that was kind of a step number one and then step number two we needed to add some out of plane stiffness and the simplest thing for starters to do is basically to add that elastic plate element so basically like an elastic out of plane uh, behavior uh, this model now we call this mvlem 3d uh, in plane and out of plane behavior are currently uncoupled out of plane is just elastic in plane is a this four node mvlem uh, it's fairly similar to perform 3d shear wall element if you are using perform 3d you're probably uh, familiar uh, with that element uh, however it you know it's an open seas it allows you using better material models there's no limits in the number of fibers and all the other things that are sort of limiting for uh, perform 3d use uh, as i mentioned this paper about this model formulation is currently in print and is basically expected to be out in i don't know i would say a couple of weeks uh so i would like to draw if you guys are interest interested i can send you a little link to sign up or something like that we can do that at the end i'll you know every time they publish a paper you have 50 days you can download a paper for free and uh, i can send you a link if you send me your email and i will send you that link and you can have the paper for free within those first 50 days so why not uh, this I, paper is gonna be i can yes. you can send me the email link or whatever i can send it to the whole group they can okay great i have like a little um yeah I mean, google form, the, google form, right cool so um, i just you know thought to 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 um spread the word because okay. many times i want to download something and i don't have subscription to it and then i have to <laughs> ask friends and stuff cool. like that um so sure i can i can forward you that information so that's that model and here's the input parameters uh i just want to describe them a little bit so basically um you need to, in order to define this element, you need to define the four nodes in the counterclockwise direction. Then you have basically array of thicknesses uh, for each fiber, uh, array of widths for each fiber, array of reinforcing ratios for each fiber, array of concrete tags, steel tags, and the tag for the shear material. This is basically exactly the same input as for the two-dimensional MVLEM, except you have four nodes instead of two. And then, uh, we have this parameter C, which represent the center of rotation. Basically, where is this, um, where is this uh, center of rotation of this element located from the bottom of the element? That used to be an MVLEM to the two-dimensional. That used to be a parameter you have to put in, but the recommended value is 0.4, and it works really well with that number. So right now, I put it into. Um, into an optional parameter. It's by default is already using 0.4, so you don't have to bother with that. Try to simplify the input a little bit. Uh, then there is a factor that you can put in to modify the thickness, the out of plane for the out of plane behavior. If you want to play with the out of plane stiffness, uh, default number is 0.63 because that gives you 25% of the out of plane moment of inertia. Uh, but if you want to use something else, you can do that by modifying this T mod parameter if you want to use 0.63 to get 0.25 to get 25 percent of stiffness then you don't have to do anything um, same thing for the poisson ratio and density they are optional parameters with some you know default values for concrete and density i just put zero because people model mass in different ways so it's possible to add that as well so that will be the input format for this element in terms of the shear flexion interaction 3D element, it's essentially the same concept. We transport for two node to the four node, then we uh, basically glue to it this uh, out of plane elastic element. The only difference right now, right, the, the, the body of this in plane behavior is shear flexion interaction model. Uh, and it, 
ultimately it becomes this SFI MVLEM 3D. This paper is currently in review. Papers take a while to get through review. I submitted it back in September, so hopefully uh, it will be out soon. And as soon as the paper is published, we'll publish the model as well. Um, in terms of input parameters for the SFI MVLEM 3D, very similar to the two-dimensional version, except you have four nodes, you have an array of thicknesses, widths, and material tags. The material tag is basically has to be a tag of the um, uh, fixed strut angle uh, material model, FSAM. So each of these panels here have to be FSAM. That's the only way to make it work. And um, same thing for as a 2D model. And these other parameters, just the same uh, as I explained for the MVLEM 3D. You know, we have C, thickness modifier, Poisson ratio, and the density. They are all optional and they have some logical default values. And finally, we have this uh, quad RC uh, element, which is uh, basically a four node a finite element type of a model. It has 24 degrees of freedom. Uh, they all really do. They all have 24 degrees of freedom in, in three dimensions. And uh, it's a standard four node finite element for emulation. We just made some uh, adjustments, modifications. So it works with this fixed strut angle model. And also it has a elastic out of plane behavior similar to the previous two models, right? So, and, and it's kind of practical finite element type of a model that you can use for three-dimensional analysis of walls or any other uh, area elements made of vapors concrete. Uh, here's the input parameters, pretty standard. It's again, four nodes, thickness material tag related to the fixed strut angle model and the same optional parameters for thickness, density, and Poisson ratio. Again, paper is in review. This paper is actually, hopefully, will be out sooner. Uh, I'm responding to comments right now. I'm supposed to send them back next week. So hopefully, you know, in the next couple of months. So if any of these uh, models or papers are something you guys are interested in, again, I will forward you the little Google spreadsheet where you can put in your just email address. And I'm, I'm just going to send you, you know, these links and information when they become available. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about validation of these models. That's, that was their formulation. Uh, we mostly validated the models with the tests from <clears throat> uh, Bayer and Constantin from, from, uh, from Switzerland. And they tested these four wall specimens that are U-shaped walls, TUA, TUB, TUC, TUD. And as you can see down here, all of these wall specimens were tested in very interesting uh, loading protocol. Uh, TUA and TUB had this kind of a spider web shape, very complex kind of a loading history. So multi-directional loading for these walls and TUC and TUD, they uh, were uh, going in mostly diagonal loading. Very initial cycles were in the A, B and C, D directions. And then most mostly the walls were loaded in diagonal directions. So that was a kind of a perfect set of experimental data for us to validate th these models because they are, first of all, uh, non-planar specimens, so they're U-shaped, and they were subjected to the complex multi-directional loading. So it was really, really uh, helpful to have this set of data uh, and validate the models against it. So here's how we build these models, just uh, uh, a little bit of information about that. Uh, when we were talking about MVLEM 3D or SFI MVLEM 3D models, we used one element for each uh, flange or web. And each of those elements were uh, discretized in a number of fibers. And you can see how that fiber discretization looked like here. In a cross section, we have confined and unconfined concrete. And, um, and we calibrated material models, basically using uh, some procedures that are explained in those papers, uh, but basically trying to match the uh, as tested material behavior for steel coupons or concrete concrete cylinders, right? Of course, we have accounted for confinement as well. Um, when it comes to the finite element model, the quad RC, we actually had a little bit, you know, you have to discretize the wall differently. So it's a little bit more finer discretization where, you know, each of these fibers now became one element kind of like here, right? So a lot, a lot more elements, obviously, in this case. So that, that would be kind of the geometry of the, of the wall how it's discretized. We apply the loading at the locations where the loading was applied. And 
it was kind of interesting to to figure out how to apply the actual uh, loading history, you know, because these uh, U-shaped wall specimens were where the twisting was fixed, so it was not twisting, and uh, we had to add some springs to stabilize the model and then apply forces on these uh, locations of the actual actuators. And this thing again, it's kind of complex. I'm not going to get too many details, but it's a, it's explained in these papers. Um, and then here you can see the the loading history that was applied in the model, which was red, and the test loading history, which is black. You can see that this is kind of the best we could do to match uh, the two. And I, I think we were pretty successful in terms of uh, that. So we applied exactly the same loading history as in the test. And here you can see a little video of, um, of uh, one of these. I think this is the quad RC model moving up and down, left and right. and um, you know, mimicking the behavior that was in the test. Of course, displacements is exaggerated here quite a bit. Uh, that was a little animation. Uh, in terms of the analysis times, uh, what's really nice about these models, uh, especially like MVLEM, again, depends what you want to do, but this MVLEM is very, very fast and very stable. Uh, convergence rate with, uh, so the way we analyze it, we first start with the standard uh, Newton method, right? And then if it doesn't converge, then we use Newton with initial stiffness. Those are the options that you have in open seas, one of the many. And um, here you can see what was the convergence rate with the current tangent, so with just the original Newton uh, algorithm. And it was almost 100%, right? In terms of the number of times, the number of loading steps where you had to switch back, uh, where you had to, where you actually successfully converged with the, with the Newton. Analysis time for each of these models was uh, also quite short, about a minute or two. In fact, I think they are even shorter now because I've done some modifications to the element to improve its numerical efficiency. So these numbers are slightly shorter than that. But in any way, it just takes one minute maybe to apply about 12,000 steps of analysis with these models. With the SFI MVLDM 3D uh, <clears throat> convergence rate a little lower slightly, still more than 99%, but analysis time was uh, quite increased uh, due to complexity of this model. And also, uh, as soon as you start converging with the initial uh, tangent, the just the efficiency of that solution strategy is much, much lower. So even if, you, you know, part of this, you see this, for example, 99.7%, you, you are able to uh, converge with the uh, current tangent and only 0.3% you need to use initial and it analysis time is 11 minutes. If that 0.3% goes to 0.8, it jumps to 27 minutes. So it's really, you know, they're related, right? So, um, so much about the convergence rates and I thought it was kind of interesting to actually compare these numbers and see what they are. This was ran on the, on the, my office computer, which is I don't know, it's not like a laptop, it's more powerful than that, but it's also not like supercomputer. So here you can see what performance, uh, what, what are the properties. Here are some low deformation results for this one particular specimen, TUB. And um, just from a big picture, looking at it like this. So here we have, it's kind of like a matrix, right? So each row represents one model of results. So uh, MVLEM 3D results are these three. SFI and VLM 3D are these three, and Quad RC are these three. Um, and here we see different loading directions, uh, east, west, north, south, and diagonal. And this is basically a square with some squares in terms of the force and displacement. So from a big picture, when I look at it, I would say, well, they're all kind of doing okay, uh, especially when I'm talking about the loading in east, west, or no, north, south direction. That is when we're in the principal direction of this cross section. Right, uh, there's not much difference looking at the low deformation relationship. I can observe that um, MVLEM 3D kind of has this funny shape here that maybe unloading doesn't match super uh, super well. SFI MVLEM does a better job in terms of that. So it's obviously something related to shear behavior because SFI has uh, kind of couples shear and flexural, and this one is uncoupled. So this really depends on the shear stiffness you put in there. But, uh, you know, in the other direction also, it's pretty, pretty good match, I would say. The major difference that you can see is, is in diagonal direction between these three uh, models. And um, 
if we start from the top, from the, this flexural model, you can see that it overestimates the strength by almost, I would say 40% maybe, uh, in as this position E over here. So when the wall is pushed towards position E and uh, better results, but still not, you know, still kind of like considerable overestimation in position F. And the reason for this is that uh, these two models, MVLEM and SFI MVLEM, use plain sections remain plain assumption. So it's kind of like a beam formulation, Bernoulli Euler assumption. And because of that plain sections remain plain assumption, you simply cannot predict the nonlinear distribution of strains in the wall across the cross, along the cross section of that wall. We will actually look at those results in a second and you will see exactly what, what causes this. So, but that's the, ma the major reason, right? When I have this flexural model, I'm overestimating by this much. If I improve this model by in introducing the shear flexure interaction and coupling, the results seem slightly better, but still overestimating. And really the only model that I was able to get uh, good results in terms of the capacity in this diagonal direction was this uh, quad RC model, which is a finite element model that actually is not based on the plane sections remain plane and it allows nonlinear distribution of strains along the base. So it's really, that's the catch, right? The, the model formulation. <clears throat> so something to keep in mind, this is, this is true for any plane section model, including Perform 3D or, or any other model. Uh, here, uh, the same results, uh, low deformation, but for TUC, a little bit different uh, loading protocol, right? Mostly diagonal. And you can see the same problems in terms of, because this was mostly diagonal, we can see that overestimation, except in the quad RC, the finite element model does the best job in terms of diagonal capacity prediction, right? So similar, similar observations, right? Here we're looking at strain predictions. Uh, I know that these slides are packed with information and I'm not sure what the practice is, but I'd, I'd be happy to share these slides after the presentation as well. And you can see in terms of the strain predictions, uh, you know, reasonable job, I would say, uh, in terms of predicting tensile and compression strains in both of these elements. And these are strains along the, the, the flange over here, along the height, right? Not perfect, but not totally off. I mean, predicting strains in concrete is quite challenging. And also keep in mind that these are really not apples to apples comparison. The models, the results are obtained here at the center line of these walls and, uh, the test results are shown for the LVDTs that are inside and outside of the walls. So, in, you know, looking at it that way, it, the model is, I would say, reasonably accurate in terms of predicting the strains along the height. And here is that plot of the strains along the base of the wall. So here we're looking at the MVLEM 3D model first. So looking at the base of the wall here and the vertical strains, right? And at this particular position C, you can see that even this MVLEM model does a pretty decent job in terms of predicting uh, the neutral axis depth, the magnitude of these strains and the distribution. And this is because we're loading it in the principal direction, right? As soon as I push this model in diagonal direction, uh, the strains distributions in the test are becoming quite nonlinear, especially as we progress and have more and more displacement demand. And um, the model just simply by, its, by the definition cannot capture that uh, that uh, nonlinear strain distribution. And it, instead it does the straight line, right? That's all it can do. And this is the reason, you know, the neutral axis depth is not predicted correctly. You have much more tension strains, therefore you have much more tension uh, capacity. And that's why we're overestimating the capacity in those diagonal directions. Similarly for the other diagonal direction over here. Similar problem, a little bit better predictions for the shear flexion interaction model. Again, these results make a lot of sense too because, uh, because this model now has nonlinear shear deformations. That means that some of the flexural strains will unload and shear deformations will increase. So similar trend of strains, but the magnitudes are smaller because as I said, flexure unloads, shear increases. And again, straight line cannot predict nonlinear, you know, strain deformations, so uh, strain, strain um, distributions. So Again, another reason we have that uh, discrepancy. The only model that can do this reasonably well is, is this uh, quad RC that does, again, not perfect uh, 
pr prediction, but it, it, it is able to capture this nonlinearity in strains at in strains at the base. And kind of interesting, really, the, the you know uh, all these global results are really affected by the, the local response. Another very interesting thing by looking at the global, uh, I'm sorry, by looking at the local results, we were able to uh, address here is to really compare the strains, the compression or tension strains, and the resulting shear stress. Right. So basically, we're looking if if I have compression in one of the fibers that fiber will be able to resist a lot of shear, right? Because the concrete uh, cracks are closed and you can you know, resist shear. But if you put tension, then you can resist much less shear at that particular fiber. And, and this, these results, now we're gonna kind of talk about it a little bit, but they exactly show that the model is cap capable of capturing this behavior, which is intuitively something we expect. And, um, it's exactly what we see here, right? If you pay attention to any of these results, compression is on this side down here, this shear flexion interaction model captures compression stresses look concentrated at those boundaries. The same thing here, if I push it to the position E, compression is concentrated here and a tiny little bit here. All the shear stresses are also concentrated here and here. And same conclusion in this direction, all the all the shear stresses are really concentrated at this boundary because that's the boundary that is in compression. Everything else is in tension in terms of the cross section. So this is really interesting and important, actually, especially when you, if you are the one, someone who is doing uh, analysis of the core wall buildings or any kind of, uh, you know, building that you know, that has a sort of a C shape or, or U shape wall like this under multi directional loading. Because this, what, what this really means is that all shear demand is resisted only at those boundaries that are in compression and the tension side of the wall, it's really not resisting much shear. So models that we currently use for design like Perform 3D, for example, or even the MVLEM, the uncoupled one, cannot do this, right? They usually assume that the shear is uniformly distributed, the shear demand, right? The shear force is uniformly distributed or in any, some other way, but in reality, it's really not like that. And then you can ask yourself, well, are the shear, am I actually predicting shear demands accurately when I'm designing this wall or not? Well, this model hopefully will help make, you know, one step forward and, and improve these predictions. Uh, a little bit of the contributions of shear versus flexural this deformations to the total. Uh, displacement, right? So the total deformation equals flexure plus shear, right? So we can kind of, uh, in our models, we can uncouple these two and compare them. They, they did the same thing with the test results. And here you can see that um, for SFI and VLEM 3D uh, in position A and E, it's almost perfect match, but then in the other positions, uh, actually, I'm sorry, AB and EF, right? It's, it's pretty good match. And the C, D, and E, F. Uh, now these are flanges versus web. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, essentially in the web, we're doing pretty good job in flanges, not as good, right? But still capturing the overall trend, I would say reasonably in terms of how, what is the contribution of flexural deformations to the total? So it's about say 80%, right? If we use the other model, the quad RC, situation kind of flips and then we're doing better job in the flanges and maybe not as good in the web. But both of these models, I mean, capturing nonlinear shear, especially in the in the C-shaped wall and their multi-directional loading, obviously, is not uh, the simplest task. Uh, but I would say these models do reasonable, <clears throat> reasonably well in terms of that in both cases. Uh, cracking patterns. We're actually able to, you know, because there are cracks associated uh, in, in this FSAM material model that we use. So we are able to process the cracks, their orientations, and their essentially evolution throughout the loading history. Here you can see just a couple of cycles at the beginning when these cracks form in the model. And it's kind of interesting to, to see that, you know, how they are developing and forming. And then what we did after we kind of observed these cracks, then we compared them with the test specimens. And uh, again, you know, the distribution, the orientation of cracks seems, uh, seems pretty reasonable, which tells us that the overall, the way stressors are, and, and strains are flowing through this model and the specimen are, I guess, in the reasonable 
uh, agree. Uh, and one thing what I was, what I kind of noticed when I was post-processing these uh, results is that, um, especially when you increase the scale factor of these, uh, uh, you know, videos, uh, they all have very different deform shape, which is exactly what you would expect based on their formulation, right? The MVLEM model is pretty much just a flexural model. And you can kind of see there's a plastic hinge forming at the base and the rest of the wall is elastic and it just, it's almost like a rigid body, right? In the shear flexure interaction model, I can see that I do have some flexural hinge, but I also have some shear deformations uh, along the, at some point over the height. And this model has both the quad RC, but it also has this breeding mode because it allows this stretching. So uh, kind of interesting and really like uh, all these models are different in a way conceptually. So when you, you know, analyzing your walls or buildings, we should be aware of these things. And uh, I would say pick the right weapon when you're, when you're trying to solve your problem. Okay. Uh, in summary here, we have three conceptually different 3D models that are implemented in uh, OpenSeas and will be public sometime this year, right? We have this flexural model, we have the SFI, shear flexion interaction model, and we have this finite element based model. They're all three dimensional, so they can be used modeling of real, real building and building systems, right? So we're, we're uh, very excited that, you know, expanding considerably OpenSeas capabilities in terms of modeling of wall buildings, right? In terms of the implementation of these models, as I mentioned, the MVLEM 3D was already uh, available uh, since I believe this week is implemented in, it's in the source code. Here is the, it's the pull request 546, but uh, I believe it will be in the la next build of OpenSeas. So it's not in 322, that's current one. It will be next one, but if you want to download and compile it on your own computer, you can do that, right? Um, the other two, the shear flexion interaction and the quad RC should come around, I'm expecting fall and summer based on how the paper reviews are going. And again, if you have any questions about these models, if you're interested to kind of follow them and if you wanna receive, uh, you know, papers when they're free, right, in the next 50 days. And if you have any questions, or feel free to contact me and I will share this Google form with Pavan and he can then distribute it against uh, participants here so you guys can sign up, sign up for or any updates about these models as well. And quickly, I wanna go through some examples over here. Here's the first example of how we use these models to do the dynamic, dynamic analysis. Like the first example <clears throat> uh, is the four-story rainforest concrete building tested at E-Defense shake table, I believe back in you know 2010 or something like that. Uh, so it's it's been a while, but this this specimen is by now I think analyzed a lot and then pretty well known. So we did model the whole building. I'm going to focus here on more the wall direction. The way we model this building, we actually have a little pre-processing tool that uh, is called uh, convert ETABs to open seats. So we make our models in ETABs, and we have like a single click type of a tool that converts it in open seas. And you can see different types of elements that. We are using here, we're using the MVLEM 3D for the walls and we use nonlinear beam and columns and the elastic shell elements for the, for the slab. So here's that tool. If you guys are interested, that's another thing that's totally a different topic that I'm not gonna talk about right now very much, but uh, there is a website you can visit. Take a look, there's a video there that basically shows how this process works of converting model from ETAPs to open seas and then it's really a single click type of an analysis and it's, it's really easy to use. And I was able to model a lot of different uh, buildings using this tool. So visit the website if, you, if you're interested in something you think uh, might be helpful for your research. Um, <clears throat> this is the model in ETABs now. So it's kind of silly, right? We're building models in ETABs. We're doing everything there and then we just convert them to open seas. But given the compl complexity of these uh, problems, uh, that was one way to do it. So we put the masses, we put the gravity loads over there. We define all the material properties uh, for concrete and steel and these spreadsheets in Excel, which are pretty kind of well formatted and it's pretty easy to use with them. And what's nice, you can also use the functionality of Excel to write formulas and stuff like that, but it's also very practical because you just define all the parameters in a 
you know, really nice looking spreadsheet. And then we also have a little macro tool that this software is uh, providing that you can define cross sections of different fibers. And the same thing for the wall elements, right? This is our MVLEM 3D. So we define all these parameters. Here is how we discretize the cross section. So we used a little bit more fibers at the boundary because we expect and we're hoping to capture the neutral apps next as, as accurate as possible. And then in the web, uh, we use a little bit larger fibers. Uh, so we define all these in the spreadsheets and then we click, you know, in the, in the that converted up to OpenSea software. We run analysis and here's a visualization of that building under, I believe, let's say 100% COVID earthquake. And there are some tools you can use to post process and create these videos. And what you're currently seeing is the flexural strains in the walls, how they, how they change throughout the, <clears throat> throughout the analysis. Uh, looking at the results here, actually, uh, in reasonable agreement with the overall low displacement behavior recorded during the test for, we have, you know, this is a sequence of ground motions. First, they applied 25% of COVID and 50% and 100%. And we can see that throughout that sequence, the MVLEM 3D, right, is doing a pretty good job in terms of the overall behavior. We also looked at the history of the roof drift, also uh, pretty reasonably well uh, predicted. So the model does a nice job for dynamic analysis as well. This is some kind of a validation. Here are some local results, which are a little bit more challenging to capture, especially after you start having degradation in the wall and different failure modes. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with the strains, at least. This is a strain prediction at one of the wall boundaries throughout these three ground motions. And here you can see the overall maximum strain profiles. Uh, you know, we can tell that the model is predicting the height or so of the plastic hinge length pretty well, the height over which you capture these nonlinear strains. And we look at a strain history, if you're not too picky, uh, and you have to kind of be reasonable here, these are really dynamic strains. So uh, in some cases they're pretty good predicted, but uh, this particular wall actually had a kind of a shear, shear failure at the base. And that's probably the reason we had larger earthquakes. We don't have a, it was shear sliding. So we don't have that good a prediction of, of the flexural strains in the larger earthquakes. Um, and one more local result is a rotations of these beams that are adjacent to the wall. This is now important because we, you know, have, have these embedded beams in the model formulation that allows you to directly connect beams to the wall. So you don't have to, to any, any kind of additional artificial elements. And these rotations are again, pretty, uh, pretty reasonably predictive, which tells me that uh, the whole connection with the, between the wall and the beam is also probably uh, the way it's modeled with the MVLEM 3D is probably uh, reasonable, right? So those are results for this particular dynamic analysis of building. And then I have one quick, quick, really high level Example is this 40 story building, Rainforest Concrete Core Wall building. Uh, it's sort of famous uh, building because it was, it, it's an archetype that's used for this uh, task 12 report uh, back in 2011. Um, so it's not a real building, but it has all components of the real building. It's a tall building, typical core, core wall with uh, core, uh, uh, core walls and coupling beams. Here you can see the plan view and elevation of this. And this is how we modeled it. Again, we uh, we modeled it in ETABs and converted it with this software into open seas. We used fairly standard approach. To, uh, these wall elements were modeled with the MVLEM 3D and the coupling beams were modeled using uh, just elastic and then shear hinge in the middle. That's kind of a standard practice uh, when it comes to tall buildings analysis. Shear hinge in the middle has some backbone curves that's validated and against the tests. So we ran this particular uh, building model uh, using a lot of ground motions at three different scaling factors. And uh, we obtained a lot of results. And this is actually part of another study that's looking into losses of these tall buildings. So, you know, here you can see uh, me medians and standard deviations of, I think it was about 20 ground motions in each of the suites. So, uh, Obviously the model, the MVML 3D, 
is working, even a big model like this, it took about, I believe, about one day for one ground motion, which is not too bad. Uh, and here you can see a little video of this, this building dancing here uh, to the left. Um, so in summary, um, there's three new models, right? One of them is already available. Two of them are coming. Uh, they have different capabilities. They are three-dimensional models. They are four-node models. And you can very easily connect these models with other parts of the, you know, the elements in the building. And they're validated. Uh, they're documented. Papers are also coming out, right? So if you guys are interested in any of this stuff, again, there's a Google form here that I will share. And there is also this convert ETEPs to open, open C software. If you're interested in something like that, take a look at the CEO structural.com. Uh, I believe I discussed this shortly with, with uh, Pavan before. I would be happy to come back and give another talk about yeah. this converter tool sometime down the road, maybe in a couple of months. Yeah. That's all I have for now. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Christian. It was like an intense one, like with a lot of new elements. And good to know that OpenSys is expanding like a lot in this area. Yeah. So that's awesome. And like, uh, guys, anyone with questions, please feel free to ask. A lot of people I know who are working on walls are here, so maybe they can. I have a question. Um, hi, uh, for Christian. Um, uh, it's very good to know that uh, the model is already available. Um, I was waiting for it, actually. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. But, um, one of these is, what do you suggest uh, for how tall or how, yeah, how tall should be the element? I'm thinking on localization problems. So what do you suggest for the, the tall of the element or maybe the, the aspect ratio of the elements for a, a normal wall in, in a building? <clears throat> so let me try to go back maybe to this slide over here. Um, well, here, okay, here we kind of overdid it in a way that we, we matched the size of the elements with the um, measurements in the, these tests. So if I'm supposed to model the actual building, I probably wouldn't use these small elements. Uh, if this is a pr like a industry project or practical project, usually we have some expressions to estimate the plastic hinge length of these walls. And then, you know, you want your element should be at least as, as the plastic hinge length, right? It shouldn't be more than that. And then you can use a couple of elements over the height of the plastic hinge, if you like. It really all depends on the size of the model, the configuration, a lot of things, but that's general consideration. Try to estimate a plastic hinge length and then go from there. Okay. Another question um, regarding to the validation that you did for by using the, the test uh, in, in, in Japan. Uh, did you make a, a, a calibration for, for your, your, your model? Because the, the match looks very, very, very good, even for the linear range. So I don't know if you perform a, a calibration previously or something like this. Um, we didn't do a lot of, I'm trying to find that. We didn't do a lot. Uh, we just use a yeah. standard, standard uh, approach, right? Uh, the model is fairly complex, so it has all the nonlinear elements. So that part of it, there's nothing much you can calibrate there except the material itself. We had the parameters, we had the material strengths and all that information. So we did it the best we could in terms of calibrating our materials. And uh, so there's not a lot of uh, kind of bogus parameters that you need to calibrate. Uh, one thing that made some difference was the actually, because this is now a 3D building, right? It's a, so all the elements interact. So the stiffness of the um, stiffness of the slab actually will, will make some differences. So we remember we using, if I remember correctly, uh, quite small out of plane stiffness and like cracked shear stiffness. So we did run some sensitivity uh, in terms of that parameter. In terms of the actual wall element, no, again, it all comes down to the materials. So that was pretty, uh, you know, just based on the test and confinement that we had. And the shear stiffness is a 
I believe, standard, like half of the G, like 0.5 G for cracked shear. It was just the linear elastic shear. So we didn't do that many, that much. And one parameter definitely played with was stiffness of the slab to observe that sensitivity. But other than that, uh, no, not really. All right, thanks. Any other questions, guys? Hi, um, this is uh, Nador from Turkey. Do you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank yep. you. Thanks. At the beginning, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about the material. Uh, you still using uh, concrete CM and steel MBF, I think, or maybe. Uh, so I, you know, there's just a lot of details here. I didn't mention that. So for these bigger models, we're using concrete O2. Uh, so for all the build the building examples. Ah, good. Because uh, as I think uh, the 2D SFI, it only works with the concrete CM. Right, I right. Think. That's another another thing we need to uh, oh, good. add to open seas. Uh, I have, on the side, you know, we modified that fixed strut angle model so it works with other material models, uh, especially concrete mm -hmm. O2 because that's like the most stable one. So you would have to do that modification to make it work. And uh, good thing you reminded me. That's something that if I, you know, if you guys want to use these models, I we have to implement that as well. Um, so we use concrete O2 for most of these analyses. So the new 3D models are working with with other concrete. Yes. Steel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, there is not all of them. There are. Uh, there is. Uh, I think concrete O2, concrete O1. And a couple of those, right? Well, they are uh, the common they, ones. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some modifications uh, you need to do when it comes to uh, this actual formulation. Oh, where was that? You know, when it comes to cracking criteria, how these uh, cracks form uh, depends on the uniaxial material models and how they crack. And, and mm -hmm. so depending how the cracking and the tension behavior is defined in uh, in uniaxial material model, and every model may be a little different. You have to kind of make some modifications to make it work. Mm -hmm. But I do plan to release the one that at least works with the concrete O2, because that's like the one that most of the people use. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe another question about um, the quad RC. Uh, could you have any sense about the meshing, the mesh size do you use for when, when modeling? The mesh size uh, was obviously these slides are not exact. Like this, this slide is exact mesh size for the MVLEM and for the SFI. For the mm -hmm. mesh quad RC is more conceptual, but the elements were actually considered on on this video over here, and so we used that. This is fairly large. We have another model with smaller mesh size, but it wasn't. Let's say the smaller size we used was half of this. So elements will be half of the size. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I'm Hardy. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is it possible to model uh, punching if we have to get the punching in labs using these uh, elements? Punching, uh, like punching through slab? Yes, slab. Because when we consider the element same as the wall, just the loading protocol, but the, the, the out of plane moment that it is applied is the same as the one of the example that you showed us. I think it was uh, Dr. Bayer's example. I think all this, uh, uh, um, how to say, the experiment were the same as if we can consider the same as uh, Wall as a slab, is it possible to get pinching all the flexural shear failure? Oh, pinching, okay. Um, so <clears throat> I thought you said punching, which is like punching. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, punching <laughs> failure and all the pinching effect, pinching shear and flexural failure, punching, yeah. I need punching in the slabs. Uh, this, these elements are have a linear elastic out of plane behavior. So unfortunately you cannot capture any punching. You would have to, 
you would have to find some element that has nonlinear through you know uh, through thickness kind of a behavior right to, to get the punching uh, so these elements are not, not it's not for that uh, is there any such a limit that it can help me to model a slow, such as composite I think, hmm, maybe there's some kind of a is it a 2d problem or a 3d problem 3d and cyclic so for punching failure through like a punching through the slab, I think you would have to use some kind of a brick elements or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some easier way to do it. If it depends, uh, if you, yeah, there's very, always, there's many levels of modeling. Like uh, if you want to make a really detailed finite element model, like abacus or something, mm -hmm. then you would have to find maybe like a, like a cubic element with concrete. I'm not even sure that's available in open seas currently. But there's other simpler models with some maybe more macroscopic elements too. Thank you so much. These elements are not for the for the cross thickness kind of a failure. So, so I had a similar question like on this lines I was about to ask like when you said three D elements like all these are three D elements right? How different are these? They are like, three. Like my question was like traditional three D, which we assume like the continuum models and stuff, right? Like in abacus and stuff. How different are these from? That, these models are not as detailed. Uh, yeah. uh, these two, the MVLEM and the SFI MVLEM 3D, they're macroscopic models. So they're formulated based on some assumptions, right? Such as, for example, plane sections remain plane, right? Yeah. We have these beams on top and bottom that are rigid. And so when I say 3D models, I mean they can be put into a three dimensional model. You can model the full 3D building with it. But what's not linear in the model is really their in-plane behavior. The out-of-plane is just linearized. So, so they're not uh, volume elements. They're still planar elements, but in three dimensions. So still like uh, it traditionally open is good for the global responses, right? We, we traditionally open is better at modeling the global responses of the structures, not like the cracking and like uh, the spalling of concrete and stuff like that because it's like a macroscopic element as you said but these are able to address some of those issues but not all of those right like that's my understanding mm -hmm. well uh these models provide local responses as well like i showed here we trains and stuff, yeah trains and uh cracking patterns you know, non-linear non-linear shear deformations cracks crack so those are all lock local responses I think that's as local as it gets, but it yeah. depends uh, what you need to do, right? These are macro models, so, but they have a capability to do a pretty good job in terms of uh, modeling local okay. responses. Cool. But if you want to model um, something abacus type, I believe like there are some elements. Or something. <laughs> yeah, bond slip or something like that. Yeah. Uh, then uh, there could be some other elements in open seas that are available for that. I don't think OpenSeas is only macro models. I think it has many different models there. Um, okay. You just have to find the right one. And just to, on a side note, you know, you can model bond slip using macro models as well. You can put uh, springs that have oh, bond yeah. slip being, you know, okay. and stuff like that, right? Any other questions, guys? Hi, Hello. Uh, I'm... Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm a student Hi. from the University of Auckland. And uh, I wonder if this uh, SFI MVLE um, 3D model can be used for the shear wall with uh, inclined brace inclined brace i'm not sure what how that uh, really... the inclined uh, brace means just like a x brace or, mm -hmm. or something like that because Is a reinforced I, concrete wall or oh uh, um... yeah a reinforced concrete wall with uh, inclined brace oh you mean diagonal reinforcement in it yeah 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 oh okay oh uh, sorry um... yeah, yeah just like this 
Hmm. It's kind of an unusual configuration. I believe uh, there needs to be some extension to this material model in order to do that. Um, this one over here. It's possible. Uh, you know, currently this reinforcement is only horizontal and vertical, but it's very simple to sort of modify it to add an angle to it. And then I believe that would that would be uh, that will enable that type of modeling. Okay. But currently, okay. currently no. So currently the reinforcement is only vertical and horizontal. Okay, okay, because I saw there are four nodes on the elements, yeah, I think maybe. You, you could try to kind of combine, you know, that element with some braces or something, but I don't know, I never try to do that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, yeah. It, it's certainly uh, something I would give it a shot, it's not that difficult and... Um, I do know that some people trying to model coupling beams like that that have diagonal reinforcement and they're somewhat successful. So. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Hi, uh, I'm Faisal. Uh, Hi. You, does uh, hear me? Yeah. Yes. Professor, do you? Okay, I have a question. Um, uh, how can we model? Uh, what's what's command for for um, uh, plotting? Do you have any command for plotting these uh, model? Plotting? Like, yeah, plotting. You mean like post processing the results? Yeah, post processing. Yeah. I uh, just use MATLAB. Uh, whenever it comes to processing stuff like this, like load deformation, any type of uh, XY plot, I just use MATLAB. Uh, no, you know, it, plotting of these uh, elements. Uh, you mean this, this type uh, of stuff? Uh, these are graphs, uh, not uh, the graphical representation, just like you show the core wall. Uh, uh -huh, like this one over here, for example. Yeah, yeah, like this one. Okay. Uh, this is actually made in software. It's called Paraview. Paraview, yeah. Yeah, it's a free software, and it takes a little bit of time to figure out how it works, but everything does, right? But it's it's pretty. The way it works for every frame, you have to have a different text file, and then you just have a lot of text files, and they all connect into a video. Um, it's certainly actually, possible. Some so that's the one that I, like. Uh... Uh, some models were uh, two, uh, two node. Uh, some walls were two node. I saw, and uh, so how they are represented in three D uh, in uh, in as plain as plain wall. Can you refer to a particular slide? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Like, uh, like I'm uh, sure if you this or if you go. MLVM, uh, I saw it was just two noded wall. Uh, oh, in the, well, this yeah. is the old one. You're talking about the the two, two node one. For example, this, this one. Yes, this, this one, this one. So it is, it is two node, but uh, graphically they are represented as, uh, as plain, yeah. So none of these, these are the old two-dimensional models that we later on expanded to the 3D models and the 3D models are all with the four nodes. And those are the ones that I was showing. So I didn't show any other 2D model uh, video. So the four noded uh, model, those, those four noded models, they can be uh, uh, output, they can uh, be represented in Paraview. Yes. By some output. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, can we, my second question, can we do uh, retrofitting? Can we represent retrofitting in these uh, walls like uh, FRP? Can we represent FRP in it? Uh, I, I would say that yes. I've never really looked into and tried to do that. But um, in design, I mean, 
if you add FRP, you would sort of increase the stre shear strength or something like that. So by modifying the parameters with of these models to kind of do the same thing, I'm pretty sure you could you could achieve that. Yeah. There's no particular parameter that you put in for FRP, but you would have to find a way to modify the material properties or any other input parameters to you know mimic the effects of the FRP. But it's certainly possible. I'm pretty sure that's what engineers do in design as well. I mean, there is no like FRP material or something like that. And finally, are there any specific recorder associated with these uh, elements? Or yeah, that's a good question. Just... And uh, it's just a lot of details here. There are recorders. Let me show you um, the, I believe, mm, see, I forgot to put that in here. Um, I will send you this as well. There is this um, basically <clears throat> repository here that is temporary, uh, <laughs> kind of a temporary user manual until I have, I've also set a pull request and they accepted it for the user documentation, but it takes time to build the actual HTML pages. So in the meantime, I will share this as well. Uh, and I, I don't see why I don't see the chat here. Let me see if I can, oh, there it is. So let me um, drop this link in chat. You guys can save it. Um, so here is the user documentation. User All right, that's that one. And then basically I've seen a couple of people already made uh, their own forks of this, but you have, uh, Description, here's the input parameters. Here are the recorders that you can do, right? You can have global forces, curvature, shear deformations, strains, stresses in fibers and stuff like that. So that's available there. And also um, here's basically the same examples with a little video of this wall moving in all these directions and results. And here is the reference to the paper. Paper is again, as I mentioned, in print right now. So. So there, there are recorders, which are these over here. Here's that, that, um, Google, Google Forms. So if you guys want to sign up for updates, if you want me, I can send you a link to the paper when it comes out. This one or any other really in the future. So there's another one. I just dropped the link over there. So. <clears throat> I can send this to the uh, people who missed the section. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll forward this to you as well. Thank right. you. Uh, and sure, we you. have one more question, Christian, on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. It is like, could you, from Mustafa, Mo Mustafa, uh, can you, could you please explain a bit more on how the, how SFI MVLEM 3D elements captured the out of plane performance or behavior, particularly how the microfibers or panels captured the out of plane performance? So out of plane was not really kind of a major goal here we're trying to address. We just added the out of plane, elastic out of plane, right? It's an elastic plate, that's it. Uh, there is no, you cannot capture like out of plane instability or anything like that. Uh, it's certainly something we, we're trying to improve and, and, and add the functionality to it in the future. But currently, it's just elastic out of plane behavior, right? And it's uncoupled from the panels, so it's kind of uh, its own thing, right? They're just uh, kind of two springs in parallel, right? The in plane and out of plane. Hello, hey, thank you very much for the presentation. I, uh, you kind of answered it, so I didn't um, stress on that. So thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, um, any other questions? Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I have another question. Uh, yeah. Have you compared the performance of these 2D models and the 3D models for MVLEM and uh, SFI, these two elements? 2D versus 3D? Yeah, in plane, in, of their in plane performance. Oh, it's, it's identical. It's exactly the same. That's the first thing we did oh. when, we, when, we, <laughs> when we did this. When we go from 2D to 3D, then we uh, 
uh, I mean, from two node to four node, the first thing we did, we make sure that we get exactly the same results. Okay, so so the uh, uh, when comparing the uh, cyclic uh, force displacement on the curve, the mm -hmm. uh, the displacement of the uh, L point L of this three D is the same as the J point in the two D. You mean? Uh, the L and J, no, so the, L, the J would correspond to the middle here, which it doesn't have a node, this guy. Yeah, right? so, so, so how, to, how to catch the displacement of this, uh, this point? So you could put like a recorder or something. I forgot uh, what the student actually did, but uh, we, and we model probably with a couple of elements. These two nodes, the L, K and L, and I and J, they have identical, there's basically a geometric transformation that you know connects these two. So okay. the element is kind of rigid in this direction. You can't really deform it that way. So they pretty much move the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? A lot of questions. That's good. That. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and uh, I have one, I mean, basic one, like I tried to use concrete CM and uh, steel MPF before, and I had like a lot of convergences, like a lot. Hmm. Like, uh, so I switched back to concrete or to, especially when I'm pushing like something to failure kind of a thing, like, or like cyclic loading, I was having severe convergence yeah. issues. I mean, I'm using the Python version. I don't know if that mm. is the case for that or pickle. Concrete, uh, oh, concrete CM, I can see that, right? Depends how big your model is or, or but steel MPF really shouldn't give you any convergence. I modeled, in okay. fact, this whole tall building has steel MPF in okay. it, so. Maybe together, yeah. so I don't know the convergence is from which component, but yeah. <laughs> I, I believe it's because of concrete CM because it's okay. a very complex model. It's a, uh, I think the source code has like thousand lines just of the different rules and stuff, okay. uh, different hysteretic rules. So it's it's fairly complex. But um, usually, what people use, what I've seen people use concrete CM is to model more like a local behavior. If you really want to capture that gap closure on some loading reloading, uh, that's the real benefit of it. The global sense, like, yeah, the, the one thing you won't be capturing if you use concrete O2 is that pinching. You can get like overly pinched behavior because <clears throat> in the concrete O2, you know, this, so the, in the concrete O2, the gap closes abruptly and that's why you have this really, really highly pinched. Yeah. But I mean, if you're not, if you don't have a problem with that, everything else is okay, more or less, mm -hmm. right? I, you can get away with, uh, with that pinch uh, with concrete 07, right, again? Yeah, concrete 07, again, here's the, the you know, with the concrete 07, you, it's kind of the other way. <laughs> ah, okay. So, because maybe I, there's a way to manipulate or, or calibrate a little better or something like that. Because I do get one, that uh, high initial stiffness thing which you are showing in concrete 02, so. That's what I was asking. Okay. Yeah, concrete O2 is issue. And you don't you don't have a control over the initial module of the elasticity, yeah. right? Yes. And if you have a high strength concrete, then that drops a lot because that that, yeah. that parabolic yeah. curve is. A, yeah. So it's like someone could implement concrete O2 version with the stiffness. That would that would be helpful. Initial stiffness, which yeah. would be a very easy thing to do actually. Uh, any other questions from anyone here? I have one. Uh, hi, Christian. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Uh, my name is Juan Thank Diego. You. I'm I'm kind of finishing my PhD and I'm working with Matias Ube. Maybe you know him in Chile. Oh, okay. Yeah, of and, course. I know him. Yeah. And I'm, I, I've been using your models. I used both of them, the MBLM and the SPY MBLM, of course, the 2D models. And one question that I had is like, uh, of course, this by MBLM uh, has uh, requires a lot of computational time because mm -hmm. it 
besides having it, well, in the 2D, besides having the three degrees of freedom at the nodes, it also has one degree of freedom for each panel that you... Right. So, and at some point I was talking also with Leonardo Mazzone, and he mentioned okay. something about that there was some project going on to try mm -hmm. to get rid of these other extra yeah. de degrees of freedom. So yeah, my question is for the... So you did it? Okay. Yes. Uh, actually, the student who is worked on that project he has his master thesis defense tomorrow morning i mean morning here but i guess over there so i'm not sure if that's possible you could probably attend it's tomorrow um and so we did it for the 2d version and it works well they basically uh they implemented the expressions for the epsilon x yes. at each fiber and you know it's validated calibrated seems to be working pretty fine. And that one is as fast as uh, MVLEO. So in terms of that, it's much, much faster. I try to use that for 3D. I think, you know, these expressions are kind of uh, empirical. So they work well for two dimensions. For 3D, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we can be get improved further. So this so is something that, model, that you have in mind. To yeah, I'm to looking to well. I have to talk to Leonardo and so on. And, and, um, but we improved it. I mean, really, they improved it. I just contributed a little bit. And um, and the model is there. It works. Uh, papers, there's going to be two papers that are both in review and uh, should be out there soon, I guess. Okay, that, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions from anyone? Mm, I mean, I, I think anything else you guys need, uh, I'm going to send you this uh, Google form thing. You have my email and uh, feel free to reach out anytime. I hope this is a lot of fun. And uh, if you have any anything, you know, I'm happy to help. Uh, thank you, Chris. Okay, then, I mean, looks like no more questions. So we will wrap it up. And I know it's already 30 minutes past the schedule yeah. time. So. <laughs> I didn't believe you, but there are there is a very good discussion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I told you, right? Like usually this session yeah, extends. Yeah. No, this is great. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, hopefully uh, about the SAP one, I'll contact you again in in some time for that. Like, sure. Uh, and that would be interesting too, and that's gonna help a lot of people too, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean uh, that little project with this. Uh, tabs to open seas it's yeah. also almost done and um, i'm expecting to have like a trial maybe in april so next month um cool. so we can you know i can come back in a couple of months and talk about that only cool. a lot of things cool yeah i mean I, I will approach you again uh soon for that then and thank sure. you so much today it was like really cool and thank I you i think like yeah. whoever is going to use this materials this will be like a proper reference for them and they can watch this and implement pretty good i think yeah yeah <laughs> sounds good awesome I'm, you know really grateful and thanks for thanks for the invitation thank you thank you for uh, the presentation and uh, next presentation will be from uh, dimitros logos from epfl and uh, he'll be i mean i'll send out an email to everyone like what he'll be talking and on Mostly it's going to be on steel structures. They developed some uh, new material model uh, in OpenSense. So it might be on that. I mean, I didn't get the topic yet, but like I'll send out.